So pick a random word like sports, like master, like talk, like trophy case, and create random presentations out of thin air. And this helps us with two things. One, it helps us think on our feet. And the second one is it helps us make sense out of nonsense. So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by Brendan Kumarsame from Master Talk. And Brendan is the founder, CEO, coach, you name it. It's got a number of titles there. But Master Talk is really a, a business about helping professionals get better in the way that they articulate. Um, both in public speaking, but also from an executive level coaching point of view as well. So welcome, Brendan. Lovely to have you here. Deborah, the pleasure is absolutely mine. Thanks for having me. No, no worries. Now, of course, it's morning over here in New Zealand, but I think it's about two o'clock your time. Whereabouts are you in the world? I'm based in Montreal, Canada. Oh, awesome. Okay. Actually, I'm coming to Canada in, in January for the first time. I'm very much looking forward to it. Yeah. Nice. Is it for a vacation or? No, it's actually to come and see my coach um, who is based over there. So in Toronto and we're doing. Oh, Dan Sullivan? Masterclass. No, no, Dan. I mean, Dan is obviously there as well. But no, this, um, I've got a new coach um, and uh, Nikki Baloo is his name. Yeah. Cool. So anyway, yeah. So yeah, we're not here to talk about me, though. We're here to talk about you. So <laughs> I've, we've just been having a quick chat before the podcast and, and just hearing your story. And of course, you are you trained originally at business school as an accountant. And that seems so far removed from what you're doing right now. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey to where you've got to right now and just share with us your professional and personal best along that along that journey. Absolutely, Deborah. And you're absolutely right. Never thought I'd ever be a communication coach. I didn't even know that was a thing. I, I went to business school never to be an entrepreneur either. I never thought I would be in business. I've always believed that there's two types of entrepreneurs in the world. There's the born entrepreneur and the made entrepreneur. So the born entrepreneur is the person who's like Mark Cuban or Gary Vaynerchuk selling lemonade out of their, their house and, and running illegal candy businesses at their high schools. Yep. Whereas me, I was never like that. I was a straight A student doing really well academically and I was more of a made entrepreneur. So what happened was I went to business school and I did these things called case competitions. Think of it like professional sports, but for nerds. So while other guys my age are playing cricket or rugby or footy, I wasn't really into any of that. So I did presentations competitively. That's how I learned how to speak. But then as I got older, I started coaching a lot of the people in those programs on how to communicate ideas, not because I was a coach, but because we didn't really have an alternative. So I just did it to help them. And that's how I accidentally learned the art of coaching. And that's what led to Master Talk, the YouTube channel, because I felt a lot of the information I was sharing with them wasn't really available for free on the internet. And then one thing led to another, and here we are today. Yeah, excellent. And so, yeah, as you said, I mean, you've got the YouTube channel that has lots of free resources and things. Um, <clears throat> tell me a little bit about why, why do people need to learn how to speak properly? I mean, it's great for com nerdy competitions when you're at school, but, you know, in the real world, what's it really all about? Right. And it'll really depend on, on who's, who's listening. So, for example, if you're a business owner, you know, what I always tell my entrepreneurs is as your business scales, are your communication skills scaling with the business? So what does that mean? That means if you're a business right now doing six figures, multiple six, let's say 100 to 300K a year, let's just put numbers there. Yep. Usually you're doing every part of the model. So every part of the value chain, delivery, ascension, marketing, sales, you're doing all of it. But then as the business scales, let's say half a mil, 750, based on the industry, obviously. And then in that context, what happens is everything that you used to do, you start to delegate to other people and you create standard operating procedures or SOPs. But in that situation, what's happening is if your communication skills aren't sharp enough for 750 or a million, you're going to create a ton of inefficiencies in your business where a lot of your employees are going to come back to you and go, huh? What did you say? What do you want me to do? What's the expectation? And you create a lot of problems in the business. But just more looking around on a bigger scope besides business, I would say communication is about leading a more fulfilling life. It's not just about getting promoted at work. It's about every area of your life. It's the way that you talk to your family. It's the way that you raise your children. It's the way that you make friends. And once we realize that, we take it a lot more seriously. Mm, that makes perfect sense. Okay, so tell me a little bit about you know what what – what do you do with people when you're trying to sort of coach them, teach them about this? How, where do you even start? Right. And what's fascinating about this industry, Deborah, is everyone has a very unique approach in how they coach people on communication. So I'll mm -hmm. give you mine. My version of this is communication is like juggling 18 balls at the same time. So one of those balls is body language, storytelling, facial expressions, eye contact, smiling, right? And the list goes on. So instead, my approach has always been, what are the three easiest balls that we can juggle to build momentum and motivation to actually practice communication on a consistent basis? 
So for me, what are those three balls? Ball number one, and we can just do one at a time for now, mm -hmm. is the random word exercise. So pick a random word like sports, like master, like talk, like trophy case, and create random presentations out of thin air. And this helps us with two things. One, it helps us think on our feet. And the second one is it helps us make sense out of nonsense. And what I tell people is if you can make sense out of nonsense, you could make sense out of anything. So I just have them start there. Mm, okay. That's a little bit like Toastmasters, isn't it? Um, I know when I've been to Toastmasters, you get given topics to kind of talk on and you go away and, and you prepare a topic. Is that similar? Yes. The only difference between table topics and what I'm suggesting, for those who are listening, table talks is just a, a, yeah, a facet of ta thing. Toastmasters where you're given a question or a prompt and you have to deliver an impromptu presentation just off the cusp, essentially. Mm -hmm. The only difference between my version of the exercise and Toastmasters, which of course is a great organization, is the random word exercise I find is a lot more efficient because there's less thought. So for example, with table topics, you actually have to find questions, all that stuff. Whereas the random word, you pretty much just have to do it. It's just like master, boom, boom. And the output is a lot faster. So the results are a lot faster. So I adjusted what they did and, and turned into my version of it. Oh, love it. Okay, cool. What's number two? Ball number two. Absolutely. So ball number two is the question drill. We get asked questions all the times in our life, our businesses, our career, and we always get bombarded with them. But a lot of us are reactive to those questions, Deborah. We're not proactive to those questions. So what does that mean? Three years ago when I started guesting on podcasts, I was terrible at this. I had no idea what I was doing. I remember some guy asked me the funniest question. He said, where does the fear of communication come from? And I looked at the guy and I said, uh, dude, maybe Los Angeles, Brisbane, uh, I don't know. <laughs> right, so I didn't really know how to answer that question. Yep. So instead what I did, Deborah, is I said, how do I take a more proactive approach to this? So every single day for five minutes, that's all I ask, yep. ask and answer one question that you think the world will ask you about your expertise, your business, your products, your services, your career. Just one every day, five minutes. And if you do that for a year, Deborah, you'll have answered 365 questions about your business. You'll be unstoppable. So that's number two. I love it. I absolutely love it. So so we've got, um, yeah, the random sort of um, words and, and being able to talk about those. And then we've got this, you know, answer a question every day for five minutes. And then you've got 365 questions. Brilliant. What's number three? Absolutely. So number three, last but not least, is make a list of the people that you love. Or if you're a business owner, make a list of the people that you love and your clients. Yep. And ask yourself a simple question. When was the last time you sent any of your clients, any of your family members, any of the people you actually care about, a 20 second video message just saying how much you appreciate having them in your life? And if you do just this, it'll teach you a very valuable lesson about communication, that you don't need to be great to create an impact. Because for me, it's not about how good the video is when you send it to your family members. It's a binary thing. Are you sending it or not? Because trust me, when you do send it, you'll realize that you'll get a lot of smiles back. Oh my God, I've never gotten a video message before, Deborah. And that's actually how I make most of my money in business for my business owners listening to this. Because word of mouth currently in our business is around 40 to 45% of our entire pie. Mm -hmm. So how, and our goal is to make it 100% in 18 months. So for us, what do we do? I just make a list of all my clients. And when it's a holiday, when it's uh, some venue, I just send them a video message. And one thing we're going to implement this year in our business that we haven't yet, but we're doing it, is I'm going to buy like a birthday hat, like a literally oh, yeah. a $5 birthday hat. <laughs> yes. And I'm going to buy a little kazoo. Oh, and yeah. then when it's my client's birthday, I'm going to send them that video message. And I guarantee I'm the only person in the world who's doing that. Actually, it is really interesting. I just got, uh, you know, Podmatch, which is, I think, how we met as well. I actually got a video message from somebody who wanted to be on the podcast the other day. And at first, I thought it was one of those generic ones that they just send out. But no, it was an absolute personalized message. She'd taken the time to listen to the podcast. She told me what she loved about it. She told me how she felt she could add some value. Wow. And I was I was literally blown away because I've never had that um, ever. In fact, I very rarely get any video messages sent to me. Um, I, can, I can count it on less than one hand in terms of the number of you received so I love it what about if you're nervous though you know people who are because we all have this fear of putting ourselves out there and what people think and then how will they perceive me and what happens if I stuff it up you know how do you how do you help them overcome that fear absolutely so by acknowledging it so for me Deborah I always like to be on record on this. I'm the communication coach. I'm the one coaching other people, but I'm always happy to say that I'm scared of communication too. 
It's just the level is different. So let's say me and you are having lunch in New Zealand yeah. and somebody calls me and I pick up the phone and it's Elon Musk. And Elon Musk goes, Brendan, I really like the episode you did with Deborah. It's really good. And I really liked your YouTube videos. Can you coach me? I'll pay you a million dollars. I'll fly you out tomorrow. Would I crap my pants? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd be a little scared. I can still do it, but I'm still scared, and that's okay. So for me, fear is not something we remove. Nerve is not something we try and get rid of. It's a mm -hmm. dichotomy we need to learn to manage. It's a relationship we need to learn to manage. So for me, the better analogy, Deborah, is a boxing match. One side of the ring, fear, anxiety, stress. Other side of the ring, message. Why does this matter? Why is this important? And the goal is not for the fear to leave the ring. The goal is to make sure that when that bell rings and your message and your fear meet in the middle of that match, your message better be so important that you get the knockout punch and win the match. I love that analogy. That's really cool. Okay, yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Okay, so I know that you actually coach a number of different types of people. And we were just talking before the podcast about those people. Would you like to explain? You've got three three types of audience that you work with. Um, would you mind just sharing what those are? And then I'd love to ask some questions about that. Yeah, absolutely, Deborah. Happy to. So the three types of people that we work with. Number one is the Indian technology professional who generally lives in the U.S. There's somebody who's been technical and engineer most of their life, let's say at Amazon, and they just got promoted into a leadership role or they're already a leader, but they're not performing as well as they want because they spent too much time coding and not enough time leading others and learning the leadership skills required to actually get to SVP, to get to VP. That's our first ideal client. Yep. The second one is really the person who is the visionary entrepreneur, someone who has a big vision for the world, but the vision is not matching the quality of their communication. So in other words, the quality of their vision, their dream is not matching the quality of how they're currently speaking. So a great example of that is a PhD scientist, someone who has a revolutionary technology, but they're not able to communicate that technology in a way that's convincing for other people. And the third one is the executive woman. So for example, we work with Chief, which is a high level, very, very high up uh, women organization with all the top executives in the United States. And I work with a lot of them because for them, it's about stepping into their power. Because right? when men apply for jobs versus when women apply for jobs, it's very different. So men look at a description of, let's say, 10 different roles, uh, 10 different responsibilities. They'll, they'll see they can do three and they'll apply for the job. Whereas the woman will look at the same set of responsibilities, look at they can do like eight of them and then not apply for the job because it's not 10 out of 10. So because of that, that's why we developed a niche to just help them live up to the potential. Yeah, That's we were actually talking about that last night, believe it or not, at a, at a, at a connector event I was at, a um, group of women standing around a table and just talking about that. It's it's real. It actually exists. You know, we, we are very much, if we haven't got all 10 there, we don't want to apply, whereas other people will, yeah, men will generally go, oh, I've got two, three. Oh, that's easy. I can I can learn the rest. Yeah. Okay. So from a, because um, obviously a lot of my listeners are, are business owners, Um and maybe they are sort of a little bit like that visionary where they are the technical person, they um, completely get what it is they're doing in the business, but they're not so great at communicating. Where would you even suggest that they start? For sure. So the rationale is the same, Deborah, across all mm -hmm. three, actually, across all three profiles. It's just, well, adjust a little bit for entrepreneurs. But the only difference, so do the random word exercise, do the question, you'll do the video message. Because I guarantee nobody on this podcast is, who's listening to this is doing all three things consistently every single day. So for every entrepreneur listening to this, the advice is the same for all of you. Book 15 minutes in your calendar every single day. You are not going to get the results listening to this podcast just by listening to me talk all day. Yeah, it's nice. Brendan knows how to talk. Wow, Deborah knows how to talk. That's awesome. Yeah. Claps for us. But that's not how you're going to get better. right? So you need to book 15 minutes every day, which brings me to ball number four, which is so simple. The best way to speak is to speak. Right? And the problem <laughs> okay. with entrepreneurs is they don't make communication a priority. So here's my message, which is more of a burning bridge, right? Because mm -hmm. that's tough love for them. Assume the business will be successful. I'm shocked that entrepreneurs don't assume that they're going to eventually have a $10 million business or a $3 million business. So if mm -hmm. that's the assumption, if that's what you're going to do, you better optimize for that end leader today because the biggest bottleneck in your business is not motivation. It's not your employees making mistakes. It's its own leader. And once you realize that you're the own bottleneck of your own business, you need to keep growing as the business grows and you need to call your shot ahead of time before those bottlenecks come into play. 
Yeah, perfect. It's the whole start with the end in mind thing, isn't it? Stephen Covey sort of like that's what you do is you you know where you're headed and we use it in EOS. We've got a 10-year target. We know where we're going and therefore you have to live as if that is actually happening right now um, in order to ensure that you get there. And investing in yourself is really important um, from that perspective. So, sorry, go on, yeah. No, no, you're all good. And I completely agree. The only thing I would add on top of that is we do that really well with the business. So there's a lot of great models like EOS that help us think as visionary leaders for the business. But we never do that for our communication. So a lot of us have goals for our business, but we don't have goals for communication. And mm. that's the problem is we don't have a communication vision for how we want to communicate. There's obviously like an hour conversation we can have around just that topic, but I'll give you three easy questions. Okay. What do you want in life? Mm -hmm. Who already has what you want in life? But then there's a third question. What type of communicator are they? We don't think about question three as businesses. We think about what we want. Yeah, I want to build a $5 million business. We think about who already has that. Okay, this person is making $5 million a year, let's say, in my niche. But what we don't think about is question number three. How are they coming off on a podcast? How do they talk in an interview? How do they talk in a panel? And when we don't spend that focus thinking about that idea, we don't actually get better to live up to their standard. I just it's just made me think of something. I mean, I think if, I'm, I'm an Apple fan, right? I'm, I'm sitting here on my Apple Mac. I've got my Apple Watch on my Apple phone, everything. And, you know, if you think about Steve Jobs when he was around, he was a perfect example of a fantastic communicator. I'm not sure how he was as a leader and a boss. I've heard mixed reports about that. <laughs> But, but in terms of getting up there, you know, and creating that excitement and, and as a as a speaker, I, I think he was quite phenomenal. Would that be fair to say? One thousand percent, right? I, mm. I definitely think that, no, actually, I don't think, I definitely know that Steve Jobs is the evangelist of the brand when he was alive, yep. right? Yeah. It is that catalyst. And even for people who aren't great communicators, like, sure, could I coach Elon for 45 minutes and make him 10 times better? Absolutely. There's no doubt. Yep. But the the thesis is still the same, which is if you want to be the CEO of a big business, you need to realize that your personal brand actually impacts the business a lot more than you would think, especially mm -hmm. if you have really big dreams for what you do. So you need to optimize for that. And I suspect that Steve Jobs, because I mean, he's a bit of a techie geek himself. I suspect he wasn't all that good at speaking when he first started. I don't know. I've never seen any early, early stuff. But I, I suspect, um, I know that um, Rod Drury is one of our entrepreneurs from over here in New Zealand. And I, and I love Rod. He's an amazing businessman and, and, a, and a great sort of um, colleague and friend. But I know that he, he struggled with, with communicating in the early days. And he spent a lot of time working on that. And now to hear him speak, you know, he is always fantastic. So uh, I think that these people, that if you're from a techie, kind of background it's not natural necessarily for you to get up there and be an amazing communicator absolutely and I, and I definitely agree I, I can confirm you know Steve wasn't exceptional in the early days of Apple he was mm -hmm. good yeah. he was good but good isn't good enough right I think that's the message that I want to send so when you compare Steve to, to where he was let's say in the 80s and there's a lot of recordings there with yeah. his beard and his stuff versus when he was presenting the iPhone for the first time which was like wow like amazing yeah. presentation definitely mm -hmm. a huge gap in skill for sure fair enough okay so now I want to ask you a couple of questions because you of course apart from being a coach you actually run a business as well and I would love to hear about your because you as you said you weren't intending to become an entrepreneur you were going to be an accountant all. which I'm so pleased you didn't become an accountant <laughs> uh, so, so so this journey you know so, so from not really wanting to be an entrepreneur to suddenly being in business and I, and I hear you've got a business partner um, you've obviously got other team members as well tell us a little bit about the business and that journey to where you are now Absolutely, Deborah. And I'm a very odd type of entrepreneur because I never had any interest in wanting to be one. And to be frank, because a lot of people have asked me this follow-up question too. Mm -hmm. If you weren't in the coaching business, what would you be doing instead? People are shocked at my answer. I always say, oh, I would get a job and just be in corporate. <laughs> they go, what? I say, yeah, business is hard. If I'm not really passionate about what I'm doing and I can't sell the product or believe in it, why would I go through the pain of being an entrepreneur? But obviously, since I get to be a coach, I'm obviously going to be in business for a long time. Yep. So my path to entrepreneurship was a little bit different than most, Deborah. So I had a very successful career at IBM. You know, I was doing six figures, and which was really good, you know, for my age mm -hmm. anyway. And I was, I was planning on just being an exec there, make a really good amount of money and just retire, like just live my life. But what happened was I kept making these YouTube videos every so week. This was, a, this was a side gig. Yeah, this was a side yeah. hustle at the beginning. Okay. 
but I didn't really think of it like a side hustle. Like I didn't need extra yeah. income. Like I need an extra five thousand. <laughs> no, I was just making videos. I was actually losing money because I was spending money to make the videos nice. Cause I just, I just thought it was good value for people. I just felt that it was ridiculous that people weren't sharing this information for free. Mm-hmm. So I was just making this these videos in my mom's basement. And then nine months went by, Deborah. It was September of 2019 at this point. So it wasn't too long ago. So my grew, my business grew really, really rapidly in like two, three years, basically. And I met my business partner, Vamsi, who had spent the last 10 years of his life kind of investing in himself. He spent upwards of like half a mil on himself and all these coaching pro, all these mastermind groups. And he is the one who opened my eyes to the possibility of being a business owner. Because he looked at me and he said, so why... What are you doing? And I said, Oh, I make YouTube videos. And he looked at me and he just laughed. He's like, What do you make a YouTube video on? Like uh, pranks or something? And I looked at it and I said, No, executive communication. I looked at me, What? This this person is making executive communication tips. So he took a liking to me, Deborah. He just started watching my YouTube videos and he said, You do realize you can charge executives thousands of dollars to work with you. And you know what I said, Deb? I looked at him and I said, come on, dude, I'm like 22, 23 years old. Who's going to pay a few grand for me? And he said, I would. And he wrote me my first check. And he really believed in me and introduced me to his clients and pretty much coached me to be the person I am today. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and that's not an uncommon story. So, you know, having a mentor is obviously good for self-development, but sometimes it can lead to much bigger things as well. So tell me a little bit about the business now. So um, there's yourself and you've got your your other co-founder, if you like. Do you have other team members in your, yep? We do, but it's a very small business. So sure. so in the sense of a team size, because coaching businesses are super coaching lean. Coaching yeah. Yeah, so it's like 85, 90% margins, which is a great business to be in. You don't have to sell <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people. I love service-based businesses. So yeah. so for us, the team is only four people, for now anyways. Mm-hmm. So it's me, my co-founder, and the two other individuals who are both my designer and my production team for the videos, but they're not full-time staff, so they're contractors. Okay, and how do you keep that team together? How do you make sure you're all on the same page and that you're, you know, um, sh- keeping in alignment with your vision? And, and I suppose actually that's a really great question. What is your vision for the business? Absolutely, Deborah. So, so for me, it's it's the vision for my life, which then leads into the vision for the business. But let me, which I'm happy to get into. But let's start with the vision for for the team. So the team is actually really not that complicated, and the reason is just because I mean, my my, my two the two contract they're my best friends. Like I've been working with them for five seven years. Me and Dan, he's my creative director. He understands my brand really well, and he was there since mm-hmm. day one. So there's not much like disagreement, or it's just we're just super efficient and we're all super aligned on what the vision. Is. So there's not much I can teach there, but in terms of the vision for the for my life and for the mission of the business, here here it is. I'll tell it through a story. It's the easiest yep. way to do this. So it's 2014, Deborah. I'm watching this video of of someone in 2014. It's Taylor Swift. So she wins an award called Woman of the Year, which is an award that Billboard gives out every year. For those who don't know, Billboard is like a music company. So Taylor is looking at the audience and she says, "This your future Woman of the Year." is 11 years old right now she's in choir she's learning how to sing she has big dreams to be a singer and we need to take care of her and then as i'm listening to this TikTok, deborah it flash forward six years into the future and billy eilish becomes the youngest inductee in the history of billboard to win woman of the year at the age of 17. So she's not even a woman yet, and she wins woman, yeah. She wins woman of the because she's so talented. And she gets up on that stage, she's got a big jacket, big bulky glasses, kind of tipsy-toeing to the stage, and she's rambling for most of her winning speech. She goes, oh, yeah, like, thanks, I don't know how I got this award, but yeah, it's great to be here. And she just keeps rambling. And then the last 30 seconds, Deborah, completely changes my life. She looks at the crowd and goes, yeah, 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 I watched Taylor Swift's uh, presentation too. And I was 11 years old. And I was learning how to do choir and how to sing and how to play piano and you all took care of me so thank you and she walked off the stage and the reason that forever changed the course of my life is because I thought about the next Elon Musk because when Elon Musk was 13 years old and he was being abused by his dad he was some 13 year old kid in South Africa nobody cared about him Nobody sat him down and said, you're going to be a big star someday. I should probably coach you for two hours for free. I'd coach him for free today if he asked me, right? But the key is nobody took care of him. 
and he still became successful. But I thought about the next Elon, because the next Elon Musk is probably some seven-year-old girl in Cambodia. So the reason I'm in business, Deborah, is because my executive clients give me the money, the firepower to democratize communication for the rest of the world in the same way Dale Carnegie couldn't because he died in 1955. So there wasn't any it like podcasts or YouTube videos. So I get to have an opportunity in my life to be the next Dale Carnegie and empower every generation of entrepreneurs and change makers to become exceptional communicators, whether they can afford me or not. That's the mission. I absolutely love it. Yeah, um, making a huge difference, which is great. Cool. So tell me, um, what else can you share with the listeners that will actually help them in terms of their journey to become great communicators? Absolutely, Deborah. I would say the biggest one, since we've covered a lot of big pieces here, it goes back to the simple question that is very powerful if you take it seriously, which is, how would your life change? How would your business change if you were an exceptional communicator? A lot of us see communication like it's a chore, like doing the dishes. Oh, I don't want to get better. But So in the same way we dream about our business, whether it's with EOS or any other framework, we dream about what we want to do in our life. We don't dream about our communication. <laughs> so I would encourage everyone to start now because communication affects every area of your life. It's not just about making the extra sale or motivating your teams at work to increase retention. It's the way that you raise your children. It's the way that you lead a more fulfilling life. So I would spend 10 to 15 minutes just reflecting on that question. Mm. And I think you're absolutely right. It's important in all relationships too, right? I mean, I think one of the things I've learned, I'm now 52, so I've been, I've been around for a while. And one of the things that I have learned is that the better you get at communication in all aspects of your life, the better life just becomes because you're able to have open, honest conversations. You're able to not be afraid of um, you know, talking uh, to people in, in an open and honest way. So it's good. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> So what do you, because you're, you, you're a coach and you tell people they should put 15 minutes every day. Do you do the same yourself? What's your morning routine? What does it look like? So, so there's two parts to that. So let's start with communication yeah. and then I'm happy to talk about morning routine because I got an opinion on that. So let's start with communication. I'm always on the record to say I actually don't do this consistently 50 minutes a day. So then the next mm -hmm. question becomes, well, Brendan, how can you recommend this and not do this? Because I'm a lot more intense. Mm -hmm. What I do instead is I'm practicing question drills and all this stuff like 10 to 15 hours a week. And the reason is because that's why I go on shows because I don't make a lot of money from going on shows because it forces me to actually answer questions so I'm always sharp. That's actually why I do these. So that's nice. one piece is is my practice integrated. The other piece is a lot more intense. So for example, like I won't do the random word exercise anymore because I've done it 3,000 times. So I'll do something a lot more challenging that I never recommend in a podcast because people won't do it. Like I practice rapping to songs an hour a week. So that sounds wow. ridiculous, but the reason, and I don't want to be a rapper, let, let the record <laughs> okay, show that. Good, yeah, yeah. The reason is because it really helps with pacing. So you'll notice when I articulate words, every word is crisp. Like you'll hear every word. And the reason is because I rap a lot. So because I rap, you have to speak really quickly at different paces and tonalities. So when you go back to being on a podcast and sharing an idea or teaching something, it's a joke. So you'll listen to every word I say, like it's honey versus going, what did he just say? And that's mm -hmm. something I practice. Actually, it's very, very true because you speak fast like I do. Uh, but there are people who speak fast and mumble a wee bit. And there are people who speak fast and articulate very well, which means you actually can keep up and, and, and listen in on what they're saying. Okay. Absolutely. Um, so tell me about your morning routine then, because you said that was another thing altogether. <laughs> for sure. You're a great listener, Deborah. So for morning routines, here's what I say. My routine is not the morning routine you should be implementing. I think the <laughs> biggest problem with this conversation, not the, sorry, not the, this conversation we're no, having, but, but the, 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 the everybody has. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. The, the conversation, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the conversation around morning routines is there's a set set of steps. You have to wake up at 5 a.m. You have to do this. Here is my encouragement. Test all of them. Do the cold plunge. Do the 5 a.m. Do the, do the meditation. Try the run in the morning. Try all of them and then optimize your routine to maximize your results. The only question with morning routines that I encourage people to think about is, is your current morning routine getting you the results that you desire in your life? And if the answer is yes, don't change it. And if the answer is no, change it. And my morning routine is waking up at 9.30, nine in the morning. I hate meditation. I'll yeah. listen to 10 hours of podcasts a week. So I do that s somewhat consistently. And that's the morning routine. That's it. 
Uh, I, I tend to agree. I mean, I think we have this whole thing. People read about, oh, what does Elon Musk do? I must do that too. And some of us aren't morning people. I actually am a morning person, but that not everybody is. And um, I, I was talking to one of my podcast guests, Scott Rusnak, who's talking about designing your life before somebody else does. And he says the same thing. It's like, actually, just be clear about what you want out of life and then make sure everything you're doing is helping to make that boat go faster. And whatever works for you is what works for you. The only thing I would say is do try and be consistent because the body is not good at having you know, multiple different wake-up times and different things to do. It has a, a, a certain desire to have a routine every morning that works. <laughs> Completely agreed. Yeah. Um, I'm also just wondering, you know, in terms of um, you designing your ideal life, what else do you do to make sure that you have everything in alignment for what you want to achieve? Because you've got some pretty big goals there around, uh, you know, helping people around the world with their communication. So how do you design your life to make sure it is doing what you need it to do rather than being influenced by what other people want you to do. Absolutely, Deborah. So there's so many directions we can go with that question because it's brilliant, but I'll, I'll give you my, my simple answer for today, but you're welcome mm-hmm. to follow up on it. And the simple answer is the following by Tony Robbins. The quality of your life is solely determined by the quality of the questions that you ask yourself about life. Whereas for me, the, the quote is a little bit more aggressive. So my version of Tony's quote is, I dare all of you to ask yourself one hard question about life every day for 30 days, because I promise if you did that, you'll never be the same ever again. So what does that look like in the context of my work? I'm still developing this because communication is my focus, but I'm, I'm happy to share what I have so far. I call these 80-20 questions. So we all know the 80-20 principle, right? What are the 20% of the actions that lead to 80% of the results? So I thought about that in the context of life, which is what are the 20% of the questions human beings should ask themselves to gain 80% of the clarity that they need in their life? So I'll give you three of them to not overwhelm people. So I'll give you one, oh, actually three. So let's go with number one. Yep. If you had all the money in the world, how would you spend your time? So if you didn't have to retire at 65, if you could retire right now in this moment, what would you do with your time? I just gave you 40 years back, 50 years mm-hmm. back, whatever. Right? So what would you do? And a lot of people don't and have a good answer. Go yeah, ahead. I was going to say, I, I, I know exactly what I would do, but it's interesting that a lot of people haven't even thought about that. Term. So my yeah. husband, um, he's not... He's a different thinker to me. And so, you know, he is an employee. He works for a business. He doesn't necessarily think about these things. And we've had some really good conversations together now to go, hey, what can life look like? What should life look like? Um, Not constrained by what you have going on right now. But as you said, what would you do if you didn't have to work? Yeah. Absolutely. And it's that question that led me to to quit my six-figure job to do mass talk. Thankfully, I I do well now, but at the time it was a hard decision. That's one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that's number one. Number two, and I love that story you shared about you and your husband. That's great. The second question is, what's? and I got this from Devon Bandison. He says, what's a goal or a dream that you secretly gave up on and never told anyone about? So that's number two. And number three is called the focus question. If you could only accomplish three things in your life and only three, what would you want those three things to be and why? So I encourage you to ask these questions to yourself. Hmm. They're really thought provoking, and I think you're right. Some people have never actually considered um, what those, yeah, those three questions, or what the answers might be. I, I will say one of the things that I've found quite helpful is actually taking time out and going away to to do some of these tough question asking. So, um, you know, actually going away for a long weekend with your partner, with your um, with your with your family, with your children, and actually asking some of these questions and sort of saying, "Hey, look." Um, yeah, what does what does it look like? What what do we want? And taking some time away from everything. So we talk about clarity breaks in in EOS, and I think that it's just as important in your personal life as well as to actually take some time out and say, hey, have I got time to spend on thinking about what is really important to me and what is important for my family, for my life? I love how that. How do how do you relax? How do you take time out? <laughs> so everyone's different, right, Deborah? You know, in the same yeah. way of of morning routines, I believe balance is a conversation you'd have with yourself. Mm. So for, for everyone, balance means differently. I mean, my my schedule this week is insane. Like, you know, I work a lot. You know, 80, 90 hours a week, I might do 15 interviews in a week, maybe even 20, it depends on the craziness of my life. But when I'm on vacation, I'm on vacation. So the conversation with my family is like, 
yeah, I work all the time. But when I take a vacation, it's like two weeks and I, and I don't talk to any of my clients and I don't do anything. So I think the the key is you got to pick what works for you and don't let anyone decide that for you. I think that's Mm -hmm. the big thing. So for me, it's work 12, 14 hours a day, every single day. And then on Saturdays, I'll take off or something. And for other people, it's, Hey, I need breaks, a lot more breaks during the week. Just have that conversation with yourself and your family and maximize your own happiness. Mm -hmm. And I think Gino talks about it in his EOS Life book. He says, hey, look, you've got to work out what your optimal kind of working week looks like. And it is very, very different for people, for different people. I mean, I know now, and I'm a little bit older than you, so I can't do those long hours quite so much anymore. But I know 55, 60 hours a week is is absolutely perfect for me. At that point, I'm at my optimal um, performance. I am able, I'm not tired. I'm still energized. I'm still doing everything right. And then after that, I actually see that kind of law of diminishing return where I know that I'm suddenly slowing down. Things aren't working as well as they should do and I tell some of my clients this and for them 50 60 hours just doesn't even you know they want to do 20 30 hours a week and others are like well yes they do 80 hours a week so I think it's important Gina says you need to just try it and, and keep trying and see look back on what happened last week how many hours did you work did it feel good was it optimal um, and then you decide what is right for you because work-life balance is so different for everybody I love my work you know I, I get the phone call from my husband at seven o'clock come sometimes I'm going are you coming home tonight it's like oh yeah sure sorry got got carried away there I'll be home soon you know so yeah it's a, it's personal stuff but being really clear about what you want 1000 wow gosh we've covered so much in in such a short period of time and sadly you know we're, we're coming to the end of, of our time on this podcast can you just can we finish up we've got so much information I've made some really good notes here but the three top things what would be the three top things that you would say if you leave this podcast right now and go and do these three things this will make a difference in your life Absolutely, Deborah. So to keep it simple, it would be my easy threes, the easy three balls to juggle. So let's recap, random word exercise, pick a random word like goose, like egg, like screen, (laughs) create random presentations out of thin air, 60 seconds each, five minutes a day, every day. Number two, the question drill. So question Mm -hmm. drill just means five minutes a day as well. One question a day, spend five minutes reflecting on the answer and writing down the answer. Do that Mm -hmm. once a day, every day. Number and that's three, your expertise that you can actually then share with the world, right? Yep. Correct. And then a bonus tip on that is if you run out of questions, just ask your clients and your audience for more and you'll have an endless supply of questions. Perfect. And the way that I do this today, which is a bit more advanced, is I guess not shows. So they're going to always ask me questions I don't know the answer to. So I always get sharper and sharper. And then the third one is video messages. Nice. Just pick a few people. Start with your clients and that's it. You know, you're famous yeah. to them. Right. Don't worry about being famous to the world. You're famous to your clients, assuming you're getting them great results, obviously. <laughs> right. And then send them videos every day, different clients. It will guarantee make you money. If you send it to if you have 100 clients and you have never sent them video messages, I'd be shocked if you don't make a dollar from the strategy. Okay, brilliant. And now you have got um, a website, rockstarcommunicator.com. Um, tell me a little bit about that site and what people are going to expect to find on there. Absolutely, Deborah. Happy to. So rockstarcommunicator.com is just a free workshop that we do on communication every two weeks Mm -hmm. over Zoom. That's open to everyone. And this is not a recorded webinar. This is live. I'm coaching people on the call. And it's not boring either. And one other caveat I'll add to this is if you're an introvert and you're scared and you're worried, it's like, oh, I don't want to come to a workshop. You could just turn your camera off and just listen. It's totally fine. But I encourage you to show up. Nice. Okay, perfect. And then if people want to get in contact with you personally, uh, they might be one of your ideal clients in your three categories or just want to have a chat to you because let's face it, it's been quite fun to chat to you. How would they get hold of you? <laughs> Absolutely, Deborah. So so the best way is definitely if you want to have a direct conversation with me is actually to attend the free training because that's one of our, our vetting tools that we use to see who's committed enough to work on their comms. But if you want to DM me, just send me a text. You could totally do it on LinkedIn if you can figure out how to spell my name. <laughs> yes, I must admit when I got the uh, the message and I'm kind of going, okay, I've got no idea how to say that. So it is Brendan with an E, so B-R-E-D-E-N, and then K-U-M-A-R-A-S-A-M-Y. Is that right? You got it, yeah. And and so you give us the correct pronunciation of that before we finish. No, you got it, actually. Kumar Sami. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Hey, look, Brendan, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for all the valuable information you've shared. Um, maybe when I come over to Canada, we might be able to catch up in person. Um, that would be kind of cool. And if you ever do want to come and have that lunch in New Zealand, um, you are more than welcome. You'd be my guest for lunch. <laughs> oh, thanks, Deborah. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for your time. And we'll look forward to catching up with you again soon. Likewise.